Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are right now. My name is Brian Najafor. I will lead our worship service or family worship service, the first part of it. And then I will call my uh, co-pastor, Pastor Jeff Noble, to do the rest, including the preaching of God's Word. For our call to worship, I would like to read Acts chapter 16, verse 25. The uh, Philippian jailer put Paul and Silas, that's the uh, uh, context here, uh, so he uh, put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stacks. And listen to what the uh, verse says. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. With the stay-at-home executive order, you may feel like you are inside the jail. But wherever you are, you can still worship the Lord, like what Paul and Silas did. You can still pray to God, you can still read His Word, and you can still sing praises to Him. And that's what we're going to do uh, today. We're going to sing praises to the Lord. Now, for our song of praise, we're going to sing Amazing Grace. And let me call uh, Brother Larry Pauls to help me lead us in singing. Amen. of our sins. So let us uh, pray together. O oh, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
we come to you as a congregation and also on behalf of our nation. Oh, please, oh God, forgive us. We have sinned against you. We have broken your law. We have not loved you as we should. We have created idols for ourselves and have worshipped them. We have loved our jobs more than you. We have loved money more than you. We have loved sports more than you. We have desecrated the day which you set aside for public worship. We have not honored our parents as we should. We have murdered unborn babies, a practice which we call abortion. We have committed immorality. We have stolen. We have borne false witness against our neighbors. We have become greedy, selfish, covetous. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Oh, we have grieved the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, you have all the right to pour out your holy wrath on us because of our sin. We deserve your punishment, O oh Lord, because of what we have done against you. But Lord, are you not the God who is merciful and gracious? Are you not the God who is slow to anger and abounding in mercy? Are you not the God who does not keep his anger forever? Lord, please have mercy on us according to your steadfast love. And according to your great mercy, please blot out our transgressions. Wash away all our iniquities and cleanse us from our sins by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, we thank you. We thank you so very much for your only begotten Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, in whom we have the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Indeed, as we often sing, wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin, taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. We are here this time to precisely magnify the name of your son, Jesus. The name above all names, the only name by which sinners must be saved. Lord, we also come to you asking for your blessing on the preaching of your word. We thank you so much that even if we cannot come to worship you as a congregation, publicly, corporately, still we can hear your word proclaimed to us. Please be with our pastor Jeff Noble as he speaks from Mark chapter 4 verses 35 through 41 on the topic of the blessing of the storm. So often we do not think that there is a blessing in the midst of our storm. And so Lord, there is a sense that there is a storm here right now, the storm of the Corona virus pandemic. But Lord, in your providence, we know that you can turn this pandemic into a blessing for us. You can use this to sanctify us, to draw us closer to yourself. You can use this virus to help us become more dependent on you to appreciate more your grace in our lives 
And so, Lord, for that reason, we also want to thank you for this storm. We thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. And please be with us even as we continue worshiping you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we have the opportunity to listen to the preaching of God's Word. And may I now call on our pastor, Pastor Jeff Noble, to deliver the message of God to us. Thank you, Pastor Brian. Thank you for that uh, beautiful prayer. To me. Uh, as Pastor Brian said, my name is Jeff Noble. I am also a pastor here, and I am the one blessed today to be able to uh, preach the Word of God. By his grace and by his grace in Jesus Christ alone. Our text this morning uh, comes from Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. So if you have a Bible, and to borrow the words of uh, Pastor David Platt, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, um, you can open it to Mark chapter 4 at verse 35. This is the reading of God's Word. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Thus ends the reading of God's word. Let's ask his blessing on his word. Father, again, as we come before you in the even though we cannot come together as a congregation all gathered in one place under one roof. Yet, Lord, we do come to you. We come to you in faith. We come to you in the knowledge that your Holy Spirit is able to go into every home, into every heart. Father, we pray that you'd be with me and that you would be with my mouth and that I would speak your word faithfully, simply. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would use this word to open our hearts, to instruct us, to encourage us. And for those who have not yet come, for those who have not yet known you and confessed you, we pray, Father, that you open their hearts, that they would turn and call upon the one name under heaven by which men might be saved, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name alone we pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, my wife and I were at a uh, wedding several years ago. And it was a pretty good-sized wedding, and uh, when it came time for the best man and the, the maid of honor speeches, uh, the best man went first, and it, and it turned out to be a really good thing. He went first, and he did an amazing job, and had everybody rolling in the aisles. Um, and, you know, at a wedding, it's always nice to be able to smile, to laugh, and he had everybody laughing. And I thought, actually, when he sat down and... Uh, maid of honor got up to do hers, I thought, that's a pretty hard act to follow. And indeed, when she began, and she was the sister of the bride, and she was about two years older than the bride, she began what I, in a way that I, I call uh, kind of par for the course, right? A lot of people, when they get up to speak for the first time in front of a lot of other people, they're very nervous and they end up minimizing it, and it all sounds the same. You know, I love this person. We've known them forever and ever. They never tattled on me. They never, they never, you know, told mom and dad what was going on with me. And um, they were always there for me. You know, kind of one of those speeches. And that's, a, and that's a good speech. And that's what we hear a lot of times. And, and she began kind of in that way. But then she got to this part where she talked about how her and her sister, when she was only 16 years old, the maid of honor was only 16 years old, and her and her sister, her, the bride was 14, and they got in a bad car accident. And um, they were both kind of okay. 
the, the, the bride was okay. She was sitting in the passenger seat. And the maid of honor kept asking, are you okay, are you okay? And um, she's like, yes, but she had blood running down her face and they, they took them both to the hospital. And it turned out that the driver, the maid of honor, had to have um, several reconstructive surgeries on the face. And, and so basically the next couple of weeks were just a blur. But she said that every time she opened her eyes and was coming out of the drugs that they put you on to uh, be able to operate, when she would wake up, her sister was there, laying on that bed. She wouldn't leave. She would not leave until she knew that her sister was going to be okay. And so this little 14 year old girl just stuck and didn't go anywhere. And it hit a chord with the whole crowd. And I looked around and I saw a lot of people crying. I think maybe everybody was crying. I can't tell for sure there was something in my eye, but it just hit me that for us watching that, we're thinking to ourselves as, as people are listening to that, we hope and we pray that the bride and the groom have that kind of love toward one another. Because if they do, not only will they have a good marriage, they're gonna have a great marriage. See, brothers and sisters, it's during the storms of life that our most precious relationships in life are refined and made better and stronger. That's the value of the storm. This past week, we, we watched as our government has worked to put together a package to care for every American for three to four months while we try to slow down the coronavirus. And, and we've seen, and, and the, their whole idea is to, to flood the system with money um, because as we've seen again this week, the, over three million people applied for unemployment. Um, and we, we see that the economy is slowing down, even coming to a screeching halt for a lot of people. And, and we know that for the next several weeks, maybe even a couple of months, this is gonna be the case. This is gonna be the situation. So they're doing everything they can do to do something that's never been done. And even in all the other nations around the world, nobody else can pull this off. And maybe we can, maybe we can't, we don't know. But they're gonna to try to take care of every family, every American, they're going to try to make sure that they have enough money to, to, to pay their mortgages, um, to pay their for their car payment, to make their car payments, and, and to have enough money for food. And, and then when we're ready and, and when the virus is slowed down a little bit, then they're going to try to jump in that car and, and turn the key and, and get the economy off to a roaring start again. And, and, and the whole idea is best case scenario that a year from now, that Americans will be able to look back at this time and they're gonna say, you know what, at the beginning of 2020, at the beginning of 2020, we thought it looked pretty bad. It looked pretty dark. But here it is a year later and, and it's not that bad at all. And maybe even in the future, we're gonna look back at this time and we're gonna say, I, I didn't even, oh, I don't even hardly remember that. But brothers and sisters, I hope and pray for the sake of every Christian right now, not just in America, but around the world, that this is one storm that we'll never forget. I hope and pray that our reaction is not to look back and forget about this storm, but that we might come to a, a point in our hearts and minds through this storm, that this is when I really began to know who Jesus really is, his power, his glory, and his excellence and his involvement in my life. I don't want to ever forget the value of that storm, right? Because even as I was telling you in the illustration, what we were hearing wasn't so much about the storm. We were hearing about the consequences of the, of the storm. And the, and the consequence of the storm was, was, was this deep, deep love that these two, that they had learned to trust each other so much through that storm. And that's exactly why God sends storms into our life. And, our, and this morning, Brothers and sisters, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever it happens to be, where you are, and when you're listening, 
I would like us to consider our own relationship with Jesus Christ during this stormy time. Even as we study Jesus and his disciples going through a storm, let us, we ourselves, meditate on our own relationship with Jesus during this storm. And we're going to look at that, this story in terms of three insights or three truths. And truth number one or insight number one is just because you're in the boat with Jesus doesn't mean that you really know him. Just because you're in the boat with Jesus doesn't mean that you really know him, right? Because here's the disciples, and then this is at the beginning of his ministry, but he's up, in, he's up in Galilee, in Capernaum, and he's been preaching and teaching, and his disciples are part of that. And at the beginning, if you go back to the beginning of the chapter of, of uh, Mark chapter 4, what you find out is, is that Jesus is in a boat, because what happens is that at the Sea of Galilee, in that particular place, the hills kind of rise up right out of the water. And there's not a lot of room between the shore, between the mountains that are rising up um, in, a, in a steep way behind them and the water. So Jesus is getting pushed back and pushed back into the sea. And so he says, I'm gonna go in this boat. And so he's been preaching and teaching, but here's what he's been preaching about. He's been preaching about in, in parables. This is when he began preaching parables and he's been telling different parables, but the, the main one, the first one that he begins with is the parable of the sower and the seed. And most of us know what the sower and the seed is about, right? There's a sower and, and he's throwing out seed and the seed is going out to different types of soil. And it speaks of how the word of God is being received. And of course, when, it, when he has an opportunity and he's talking to his disciples by themselves, he gives them the inside story. He tells them what it means, what, it, what, what these parables are really talking about. And he tells them that it's because they, he's telling them these things because they are those that are blessed and chosen to, to share in the mystery of the kingdom of God. But brothers and sisters, you know there's a lot of difference between understanding what God says um, in a mental way. Jesus is teaching them, he's preaching to them, and then he's also explaining it to them. But knowing something in your head and knowing it in your life, knowing it experientially, are two different things. And that's what's happening in our text. And, and we can see that right here in, in the first part. In verses 35 and 36, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, it's now evening, and he said, let's, let's go. We're gonna go, let, let's go to the other side of the lake. And in verse 36, we read, Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. Now, if you read that sentence carefully, and you look at it, you have to do a double take. And many of us would read that and say, well, that's just ridiculous. That's just bad, bad English, bad Greek, bad Hebrew, whatever, right? Because you're looking at that sentence, and it doesn't really seem to make sense. Why is it so clunky? Well, there's a reason why it's so clunky. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. Why is it written so strangely? Does Mark just not know what he's doing? Is the Holy Spirit just kind of missing a step on this particular sentence? Or is there something else going on? And of course, there's something else going on. There's always something else going on in the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't make mistakes. Here's what's happening. Now, when they left the multitude, Jesus is already in the boat, as we know. He's already in the boat when he tells them, let's go across the lake. And so what happens is they leave the multitude, right? Because they're on shore with the multitude. And that's an important point. They're part of the multitude. They're listening to the words of Jesus just like the rest of the multitude. Okay? But now he calls them out to, to, go, and, and to go across the lake. So they leave the multitude and they get into the boat. And this is where it gets confusing. And this is what the writer is telling us. There's some confusion here. There's some confusion in the mind of the disciples about who is who and what is what. Right? Because what happens is Jesus is the one that drives the action. Jesus is at the center until this moment. In verse 36 it says, Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat. And of course, as he was, he was already in the boat. So why does it say they took him along, right? They is the subject. They are now in charge. Well, brothers and sisters, here's what's happening. 
This is the confusion. The confusion is in their minds, right? Jesus is a rabbi. He's a teacher. And we think we heard something about the fact that when he was in Nazareth, as he was growing up, he was also a carpenter. But he's never been a sailor. He's not been a fisherman. He doesn't, he doesn't operate boats on the Sea of Galilee like we do. This is our world. This is our area of expertise. And Rabbi, no disrespect, but things can sometimes get a little hairy out there. It gets a little, you know, and sometimes we gotta, we gotta bring the sail around fast. And if you don't know what you're doing because you're a land lover and it's just kind of rolling around like that and, and that sail comes around and, and you're not paying attention, you can get right, knocked right into the water. So we'll take charge. And you go sit in the back of the boat. Lay down, relax, and stay out of our way. That's what's going on. We're on the sea now. This is our world. And brothers and sisters, what's happening with the disciples is something that happens with us, and it happens with the church, and it's very marked in the church in America. Because we do it all the time. We believe in Jesus, we follow Jesus, we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. But when was the last time that you asked, got on your knees and asked Jesus about your schedule for the next year or two? When you're making all your plans, when you're making plans for your life, when you're making plans to go to college, when you're making plans on your next vacation, when was the last time you got on your knees and you started asking Jesus about where you should invest your money or should I invest my money or what should I do? Right? How, how should I set up my retirement? What kind of a job should I take? When was the last time that we asked, asked Jesus about those kind of things? Well, the truth is, is, many of us in the church never do that. Why? Well, because Jesus can tell us about the, the kingdom that's coming. He can tell us about the world that is to come. He, he can tell us about God and heavenly things and angels and, and, and eternal life and salvation. But he, he's no finance expert, right? He, he's not a life expert. We, we've got all kinds of people. I, I see, I've got all kinds of ideas about what I want to do with my life. I've got all kinds of ideas about what kind of job I want to have. I've got all kinds of ideas about how I want to run my marriage or bring up my children. Why, why do I need to ask Jesus these things? This is our world. And we've got experts here. We've got... We've, we've got investment counselors and, and, and finance people that we can talk to about taking care of our money. And, and I have my own heart, my own desires about what I want to do with my life and my plans for my life. Why do I need to talk to Jesus? You know, I, I know I'm going to see him later. And I know in, in a way that he looks over the whole thing and kind of rules over the whole thing. But he doesn't, I don't need to drag him down with that. That's what they're doing, right? Jesus is a rabbi. You look at rabbis, they're a lot like preachers, right? A lot of them are weak and our eyes are bad and, and we're squirrely and little and, and we're good in the library. But, you know, in real life, get out of the way, pastor, get out of the way. We'll take charge of this, right? Well, that's what they're doing with Jesus. And the reason is, is that even though they're following them, even though they believe that he's the Messiah, they don't really know who he is. And the same thing is true about us. There's a lot of times we just don't know who he is, brothers and sisters. And, and why don't we? Why don't we ask Jesus about these things? Because it seems to work pretty good without him. Because I can set my plans, and a lot of times my plans go the way I want them to go. So why ask Jesus? And if I'm investing my money, and my money's safe, and it's growing, and, and I like what it's doing, why ask Jesus about it? Right? If, if my life seems to be okay, and my kids are seem to be okay, I don't need to ask him. And as long as things are going good, why ask Jesus for anything? Just thank him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Everything seems to be going just the way I'd like it to go. And, and, and you know what? That's the way we live our lives. And it, and, it, and it works fine until it doesn't. We 
brothers and sisters, it was working fine for these sailors too, until it wasn't. And that brings us to the second truth, right? What happens when it doesn't? What happens um, when a storm comes? And this is where we find our second insight or our second truth. When a real storm hits, we are quickly overwhelmed and all our expertise and our confidence fly out the window. When a real storm hits, all of a sudden, that knowledge of our world and our expertise and confidence in our world, it's out the window. And that's what happens, right? That, that's what it says in verse 37. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Right? And, and if you read about this, this is one of the fun parts of being in the ministries. You get to research this kind of stuff and I don't have time to share all the kind of things that I can learn. I've learned about these windstorms. But they're quite frequent in the daytime. And it has to do with the heat up top, right? Because they're down below sea level, about two, 3,000 feet. And what happens is the, the heat on top and the, and the wind going through the mountains, it shoots down into the Sea of Galilee and they get hurricane type force winds. Winds that are 80, 90, 100 miles an hour. And sometimes even on the small lake, it's only about six or seven miles wide, it's about 13, 40, 14 miles long, but it's 165 foot deep, which is pretty deep. And so what can happen is you can actually get waves that jump up to almost 20 feet. They're fairly common during the day, but they're incredibly rare at night. They almost never happen in the night, which is why the, the disciples, of course, have good confidence that when they're going across the lake, they're going to be fine, except this one hits at night. And it hits so hard, and it hits so fast, that this small fishing craft, and these, these craft, right, this is 2,000 years ago, when, when they would throw their nets over the side, they didn't have pulleys and, and gears and everything to, and engines to pull the, the nets or the fish up. They had to reach over the sides, and so the sides were low. And you start getting 10, 12, 15 foot waves or more slamming into the boat, they filled the boat like that. Almost instantly, the boat was filled. And what happens when the boat's full? Brothers and sisters, most of us are not sailors. I know there's a couple of you out there that are, but most of us are not sailors. But you don't have to be a sailor to know that water outside the boat, good. Water in the boat, bad. Not a good thing when the boat gets full of water, right? So now what are these experts going to do? Well, what can they do? Right? They're, they're overwhelmed. All their knowledge, their understanding, their confidence, their expertise, on, in their world, it's out the window. They're completely overwhelmed. They, they, they don't know what they're going to do, right? Because you can be the best sailor in the world, but if your water, your, your boat's full of water and it's going down, there's nothing you can do to stop it, right? The captain of the Titanic was a great sailor, a well-known man in, in the sailing world. But once he, hit that, once he hit that iceberg and that boat started going down, there was nothing he could do. They have hit the end of themselves, and it happened so fast, just like that. And brothers and sisters, how many of us in these last few weeks haven't been experiencing the same thing? How many of us are not worried about losing our jobs if we haven't lost them already? Because there's people already that are losing their jobs and being laid off, and they don't know when they're gonna get called back, and they don't know what's gonna happen next. How many people are not just worried sick? I can't set up my year like I used to. I had a schedule for this year. I was going to do this, that, and the other thing. And I had plans, and now my plans are out the window. What about our money, right? What about our savings? What about our accounts that we've got put away and we guard them carefully and, and we know that they're there? And, and now when we call our finance experts, our finance experts right now don't sound very expert. Okay, they don't sound like really there's anything they know what they can do, right? The best thing they can tell you is, well, hang on and pray that it comes back. That's the best thing they can tell you. Brothers well, and sisters, when storms hit, they flip us upside down and they quickly destroy all the confidence and all the expertise and all the knowledge that we think we have in this world. 
It grabs us and it shakes us. And we don't know what's going to come next. But there's blessing in this. Even as it was blessing for the disciples. There's blessing because, you know what? And you can tell from their plea and from their cry. They don't know what's going to come next. And they don't even know what Jesus can do. But finally, there's nothing else they can do. Let's go talk to the rabbi. That's what they call him, teacher. They don't call him rabbi, but they call him teacher, didaskale. Teacher, do you not care? Do you not, are you not concerned that we are perishing? Right, because in their fear and in their desperation, they don't come to him. The, the respect and the honor, the, just the idea of humbly coming to him and, and crying out in, 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 in fear and humility, it, it, no, there, there's, there's anger and frustration and all the kind of things that we all experience. How many Christians have done the same thing in this time? How many Christians haven't cried out, Lord, everything's falling apart. My whole life's falling apart. Everything's, everything's broken. Where are you? Well, I'm sleeping in the back just like you wanted me to be. You didn't ask me for my help before, but all of a sudden, no, you won't. My brothers and sisters, what an amazing blessing that we have. That we have Jesus in the boat. Because even in fear and desperation, if we've forgotten about him up until now, if we haven't really seen how he's supposed to be involved in our lives on a daily basis, in all of our life, maybe if we've messed that up, even right now, this storm that's hitting, and brothers and sisters, this storm that's hitting, it's not just hitting you or our congregation or, or Grand Rapids or West Michigan or, or, or even just America. It's hitting the whole world. It's hitting the whole world. And, and if you watch what's going on there, I was listening to a podcast between a couple of fellows the other day, not Christians either one, but one was a Navy SEAL, but they, but they were both competent younger men in their early, mid 40s or so, or uh, early 40s. And, and the one says, you know, I just wish somebody would tell me the truth and, and, and tell me what's, what's, you know, what's happening and what we need to do, right? Obviously, he was disparaging our leaders. But the other one said, very competently, said they don't know what to do. Nobody knows what to do. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. The nations are flipped upside down. If you study what's going around in nation after nation all over the world, they're all desperate. They're all panicking. They're all trying their best. Because this storm has filled the boat. And they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to deal with the sickness itself, though they're trying to catch up. And they certainly don't know how to deal with the economy. Because they know this, that once an economy slows down or even screeches to a halt, it takes a while to get it back up again. And they're worried sick about that. So brothers and sisters, your fear, you're not by yourself. And there's, there's no world leaders or professors or somebody out there that's sitting on the sidelines going, oh yeah, this is going to be fine and this is exactly what we're going to do here, here, here. No. The boat is filled right now. And that's why we should be turning to Jesus at this time. This is when we should be getting down on our knees before him and crying out to him even as the disciples did. It's a gift. It's a blessing to actually have your boat filled. It's a blessing to actually hit that desperate point when you don't know what's gonna happen next. And, and you know that you can't handle it. Now, that's one of the greatest blessings that the children of God ever have is that we find out and we finally realize, I can't handle this, I can't fix this. I don't have an answer for what comes next, excuse me. You see, when we experience the storms of life and we're filled with enough fear and anxiety, this is what it does. It drives us to Christ. And when we are driven to Christ, there are two great outcomes and two great outcomes that we see in our text. First of all, and this is the third insight of the third truth, it's only in these storms when we really begin to see and to know Christ for who he is and ourselves for who we are. All right? So the, the first thing we see is that they 
turned to him and they cried out to him. And, and maybe we, we can, we can you know, shake our finger, but I don't think we should because many of us are the same way. You know, they're just crying out to him. They don't, teacher, you know, do you not care that we're perishing? So in their fear and in, in their, their uh, frustration, etc., they don't even know what he can do, but they turn to him. And we see something amazing. Jesus doesn't wake up. He doesn't just stand up. He arose, right? Mark uses that word for a reason. He arose, just as he'll use it when he's done with the resurrection, at the resurrection. He arose. Jesus arose, and, he, and into these hurricane gale force winds, he looks into these winds, and he puts his hands up, and he rebukes. He rebukes the wind, and he rebukes the sea. And our, our text says that, that he said, um, he, he said, Peace, be still, but I don't like that. And I'll tell you why. Because the word peace there isn't the word peace that we think of, right? In the Old Testament, it's shalom. In the New Testament, in the Greek, that word for shalom is arene. That's not what this word is. This is a different word. This is a word that says, be quiet. It's the same words that Jesus used when he was, uh, when he was rebuking a demon that was in a man in Mark chapter one. Be quiet, he says. He says, be quiet to the wind. And then he turns, or kind of the idea that he speaks to the sea, and he says, shut your mouth. It's actually the word that means muzzle your mouth, literally. And you think of a wave, right? When a wave is rising up, it's like an open mouth. And as it comes down, it's shutting its mouth. So it's open and it's shutting, right? And, and it's eating, right? He says, shut your mouth. Be quiet and shut your mouth. He says to these hurricane force winds, and he says to this sea that is filling their boat, and immediately there's a great calm. It was a great wind, now there's a great calm. And you see what happens, right? The, this is when they really find out we, we didn't know who he was. Right? Look at, if you look at the last verse, they feared exceedingly and said one, one to another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? They didn't know who he was. He's the Lord of the wind. He's the Lord of the sea. He's the Lord of the earth. He's the Lord. And, and you and I confess this. You and I believe this. You and I have said this, even as we made confession, that my whole life belongs to you and every part of my life belongs to you. But somehow we never really fully gave it up, did we? If you've been afraid, if you've been afraid, brothers and sisters, and if you've been quaking and you've been thinking about all the things that you're losing in the world, and finally in desperation you return to Christ, know why it's happening. It's happening because we never fully knew him. We never fully saw him for who he is, the Lord of every square inch. He owns it all. He owns my life. He owns your life. He owns our money, our money, that thing that we always like, our money, right? He owns it all. And one of the beautiful things that we see is that part of our desperation at a time like this is we see some of the things that we care about so much being pulled away from us or the possibility of them being pulled away. And that's what frightens us. Brothers and sisters, that's not what should frighten us. What should frighten us, there's only one thing that we can lose, that we should be afraid of losing, is that it's Jesus. And I don't believe that anyone who truly has Jesus can ever lose Jesus, because that's in his hand. But we should have the same kind of heart that David has, that when he says, take not thy spirit from me, don't remove me from your presence. And we should have that sense that it'd be better to lose everything in this world than to lose Jesus. Because he owns it all, and that's what he shows them, that's what he proves to them right there. I'm not some lily-livered, weak little rabbi that knows a lot of stuff that doesn't know anything about life. I'm the Lord of heaven and earth, the sea, the dry land, and I'm the Lord of your life, every part of your life. 
And brothers and sisters, one of the things that happens when we begin to see as we turn to Christ and we come to him crying out for his help, he reveals to us his power. He reveals to us his strength that he says to our souls, be quiet, be calm. And now he says peace. He actually says peace to his, to his people. Shalom. He can give us that great calm at a stormy time. But it comes at a cost, right? He reveals to us who he is. And we see him maybe in a, in a way that we never saw him before, which is an awesome blessing. But it comes at a cost. And it's a cost worth pain. But it comes at a cost of a little pain. He says, why are you so fearful? Right? And this is not the regular Greek word uh, that is used for fear, terror, etc., which is the word phobos. We get the word phobia from that. It's, it's a different word. And, and, and it's kind of a gut-punching word because why are you so timid? Why are you so cowardly? That's the word. Why are you so timid? Why are you so cowardly? You see, because Jesus knows us. And he knows when the storms hit, the first thing we do is grab onto the securities that we have in this world. We grab onto our possessions. We grab onto our jobs. We grab onto the things that we, we know. We've got our, our savings and this and that, et cetera. We grab on and we hang on to these things with, with all our might. Jesus knows that. Jesus knows they tried everything and, and they didn't even want to come talk to him. And that's why he says it. Why are you so timid and cowardly? Why are you so scared to death of what's happening to you? Don't you know who's in the boat? Right? Because that's what he says next. How is it that you have no faith? Right? And you go back to the beginning, brothers and sisters. You think about all day he's been teaching in parables. What kind of soil are you? Right? Because if you're the fertile soil that that plant comes up and it brings forth 30-fold, 30, 30 60-fold, 100-fold, if you're that, that means that you're someone that truly has your faith in Christ and in Christ alone. Brothers and sisters, it's the storm that brings us to a knowledge of where our relationship with Christ really is. These storms are a gift. This storm is a gift. It is a blessing because it's not just, it's not just us. Because he can heal us, he can strengthen our faith, he can encourage us, he can bring us to a better place than we've ever been in our relationship with him. Where we finally just say, Lord, you own every square inch. And, and you know what? Let me just serve you. Let me just glorify. Let me just exalt your name. But I saw a video, my wife showed me a video the other day of uh, um, just a short clip that somebody had put online and they were showing some empty shelves at a store where the Bibles were usually. And they said, this is the kind of, this is the kind of empty shelves I like to see. Their Bibles were all sold out. You see, there's lots of other little boats around us, right? There's lots of other people right now that see and they understand. Maybe some of us don't even fully understand how bad this thing is or can be. But there's other people that are saying, maybe Jesus is coming. Not tomorrow, maybe not the next day, but maybe he's coming sooner than we think. Maybe he's preparing us for something. Maybe I should turn to him and believe, trust now. Mm -hmm. and, and brothers and sisters, I, that's why it's so important for you and I who are confessing Christians that that our faith would become stronger and brighter so that when other people around us say, oh, you're a Christian, could you tell me some things about the Bible that I've been reading? Can you tell me some things about Jesus? That you'll be able to say, sure. Let's talk. Brothers and sisters, there's a wedding feast that's coming up. And there's going to be some beautiful stories. But I hope our story is going to be the story of that 
sister, every time she woke up, she saw her sister laying on that bed who would not leave her. I hope our story will be that this is the time that we came to see that Jesus is in our boat. He's in our life. He's here. He's now. He's present with us. And when our eyes are open, we see him. We see him. He's our strength. He's our power. And he's the glory of our life. And so let's give up. Turn from the securities of this world. Because brothers and sisters, I hope and pray, just like other people hope and pray, that somehow the economy can get going again and that, that things will go well. I, I do. I, I'm just like everyone else. We don't want to see horrifying things happen and jobs and lost and staying lost and, and, and millions of people not having jobs. Nobody wants to see that. But here's what we as Christians do not want. We do not want to trust in government. And I'm not saying don't trust the government, but I'm just saying you don't want to place all your faith and your trust in the government, in the nations of the world, in the economies of the world, in your savings accounts, or any of these other things. Jesus is teaching us. I'm in the boat. Look at me right away. Amen. Our Father, once again, we go before you and we pray, Lord, that you would write these words into our hearts. For it is one thing to, to learn something, to, to, to learn, to, to read your word, to study your word, to know the doctrines of salvation, to know about Christ. It's another thing to come to know Christ personally. It's another thing to see Christ actually working in our lives. Lord, we know that we are scared and, and, and there are many things that are very upsetting going on around us. Lord, we pray that you put great calm in our hearts, that our eyes would be focused on you, that we would understand that we have the Lord of all life in our boat, that you are with us, that you are in us, that you will strengthen us, that you would encourage us, and that you are the one alone who can guarantee results. You alone are the one who can give salvation. You alone are the one who can hold your people up and keep our feet from, from dashing against the rocks. Lord, may your name be praised and glorified above all other names. All these things.